afternoon. I have several announcements. Every doctor, every hospital, every nurse has been notified. Every woman in this country must be aware that it's most important that they check their medicine cabinet and that they do not take this drug. In the early 1960s, no drug struck more fear into the hearts of pregnant women. One of the most horrifying episodes in medical history. Than thalidomide. It changed our relationship with the drugs we use. One reason U.S. drug laws are so strict, thalidomide. And became an example of what many saw as corporate greed at its worst. British thalidomide children so far have not received any compensation from the rich company that made the drug which crippled them so brutally. But this dark chapter is only part of thalidomide's enigmatic story, one that continues to reverberate today. I had used up every other alternative when I took thalidomide. In 1960, a new wonder drug was slated to arrive on American shores, a sedative that was said to also treat a range of other ills. A hypnotic, as the doctors call it, that was the answer to a prayer. Its generic name was thalidomide. The hallmark defining quality of thalidomide was its safety. So safe that in Germany there was no prescription needed. The German company that developed thalidomide, Chemie Grunenthal, claimed that even pregnant women could take it. The drug company had handed out samples of this drug all over the place, starting with employees of its own company. On Christmas Day in 1956, a baby girl was born in Germany without ears. And she was the daughter of an employee of the drug company Grunenthal. No immediate connection was made to thalidomide, which soon sold nearly as well as aspirin in some European countries. We received it in quantities, like a thousand pills. There was tremendous pressure all over the world to get this wonderful new drug on the market. They had two million tablets ready to go the moment the FDA approved the drug, which was almost a foregone conclusion until one doctor came along and began working at the FDA. It just so happened that my first application was for the drug thalidomide. I got this because I was new and they thought I should have an easy one to start on. But Dr. Kelsey was uneasy with what she saw as the lack of rigorous scientific studies and the slipshod presentation of safety data provided by Grunenthal and William S. Merrill the U.S. distributor of the drug. The best thing that could be said about thalidomide at the time was simply that you could not kill a rat no matter how much thalidomide the rat ate. With thalidomide being prescribed for morning sickness in other countries, Kelsey became particularly concerned with what effect it might have on a developing fetus. In June of 1961, an article appeared promoting its safety during late pregnancy. It was allegedly written by a Dr. Ray Nolson, but in fact, the article was written by the medical director of the drug company. About six months later, long ignored evidence became public in Germany, linking thalidomide to a rash of birth defects. Although hundreds of thousands of pre-market samples had been provided to American doctors, Dr. Kelsey's stubborn delay of the drug's approval for more than a year had prevented a similar scale of tragedy from unfolding in the United States. Dr. Kelsey was absolutely a unique hero in American history. But thalidomide's reach continued to be felt across the rest of the world, including in Trinidad and Tobago, where Giselle Cole was born. When I came along, I'm a firstborn, and they were a young married couple. I mean, I was never unloved or not wanted or anything like that. But uh, I would be foolish to think that it was easy for them. My disability is, uh, the official term is focomelia, coming from the Greek meaning shorter arms or flipper-like. I think people always expect that I would have been angry, and I'm certainly not angry and never have been. Long discussed but seldom implemented, major regulatory reforms were finally forced on the pharmaceutical industry following the thalidomide scandal. For some time, President Kennedy has tried to get Congress to approve new controls, but without much success. 
Now, with the thalidomide scare, most of the opposition has melted. Largely the same FDA guidelines that we live under today were created in the immediate wake. These regulations were too late for thalidomide's thousands of surviving victims across the world, who soon became the story. Philippa Bradbourne is one example. Her mother rejected her. Ten-year-old Carl Davies leads a relatively normal life for a boy without arms. Another young mother, her husband, her sister, and her doctor are charged with the mercy killing of her deformed infant. I'm one of the lucky ones in that my parents were adamant that I was their daughter and their daughter first before anything else, and it was treated as such. Many were put in homes because they just didn't know what to do. Some families battled with doctors to have amputation of fingers and toes and whatnot to accommodate these prosthetics. Many families were broken irrevocably. Instead of quickly settling, the drug companies dug in, with Grunenthal originally arguing that the children's deformities were caused by everything from nuclear fallout to botched home abortions, anything but thalidomide. It was a very long and difficult process. Most cases were eventually settled, but litigation continues, with some survivors saying the original settlements cannot cover the cost of their specialized care. Grunenthal didn't apologize to its victims until 2012, 50 years after the tragedy unfolded. They issued a statement saying that it has taken them the 50 years to come forward to say anything because they were shocked. They don't have a right to be shocked. The shock doesn't belong to them. Despite all that thalidomide's victims endured over the decades, they could long take solace in one simple fact. Thalidomide is now banned everywhere. The now banned thalidomide. The drug was banned in 1962. And I would have liked to have seen it never used again.